second lecture this week is on behavior management in pediatric physical therapy, um, but it's not really exclusive to um, pediatrics, and it's not even exclusive to physical therapy. A lot of the strategies that you're going to see um, really come from classroom teachers, but they're utilized in all areas of um, schools and homes and you know other um, facilities to help um, improve participation and you know minimize challenging behaviors that get in the way of that. This is really an introduction to learning some of the strategies and to familiarize yourself with it so that when you see it in clinic, um, you'll know what they are. But it really does take practice and trial and error and learning on um, on the job. So on your rotations or in your first jobs, um, you're not expected to be an expert at behavior management, right? You know, at, off from graduation or even in your clinic. Um, this is really something that takes time to develop. Um, but from this, you'll you'll see some of the things that are used and, and learn some of the strategies that will help um, not just in pediatric in whatever facet of PT you wind up in. Um, you find challenging behaviors in all walks of life. So, um, you know, don't expect that this is only just a pediatric thing because it is for sure not. Um, after this, we head to um, the clinic for lab where you're going to be observing sessions in OT and PT and hopefully identifying some of the strategies that are being utilized in the clinic um, based on what you've learned from this lecture. The children in the video that you saw um, are showing behaviors you know, that you would typically see in a preschool classroom. Uh, when children are interacting with each other um, or having to follow you know classroom routines and rules and you see some uh, challenging behavior some hitting yelling um, things like that so why am i showing that to you because we're not teachers we're not going to be um, you know working with kids in a preschool classroom where there's you know five or six or seven kids all trying to work together uh, because well, you might not sh see what, you know, the research describes as challenging behavior, which is really that's extreme behavior that's injurious to the child or, or others. But you are going to see behaviors that are challenging to getting a productive session. So kids that refuse to participate, um, kids that run off, kids that want to do something else. So for the purpose of this lecture, we're going to refer to all of these types of behavior as challenging because it's challenging to us getting our uh, session done but in reality when challenging behavior is typically defined as that extreme behavior um, so why do we see it so much well children with disabilities are two-thirds more likely to display challenging behavior um, and a lot of that has to do with limitations that they're having in, in other areas of development as well. Um, and as um, in that group of kids, about 10 to 15 percent of them are going to show that self-injurious, aggressive, harmful behavior. Um, in the research, you might see it as high as 82 percent, but a lot of that research has been conducted in um, specialized residential settings where they have a large population of children with that more extreme behavior. Um, but families of children with intellectual disabilities um, who exhibit challenging behavior really uh, report high levels of stress, um, inadequate family support. So the people that are um, working with them to help a lot of times they report that they just feel like they're either um, not trained enough or not experienced enough or can't follow through enough to actually give the, the family some meaningful strategies and support. Um, and, you know, 
what happens sadly a lot is the children with this extreme level of behavior wind up being placed in a residential setting um, because there's just, you know, the families are just tapped out and, you know, that seems like the only other option. This is a, an interesting quote. If a child doesn't know how to read, we teach. If a child doesn't know how to swim, we teach. If a child doesn't know how to multiply, we teach. If a child doesn't know how to drive, we teach. If a child doesn't know how to behave, we teach, punish. Why can't we finish the last sentence as automatically as we do the others? So is behavior inherent? Is it a learned skill? And what's the best way to go about getting the best behavior? Teaching, punishing, rewarding? Um, it doesn't seem like it's as cut and dry as it is for other skills. Behavior in itself is a form of communication and all behavior serves a purpose. Um, it's the challenging behavior tends to stem from a couple things and an inability to communicate and whether that's a child being nonverbal or having severe articulation issues where they can't be clearly understood or a severe stutter where they have trouble getting the words out um, or they ha they're verbal, but they're, they have trouble connecting uh, the names of what their emotions or what they're trying to say, whether they you know, can't express what they're saying because they don't know the right words to use or they can't formulate the sentence. Um, so even teaching children oh, the word um, for their emotion, like, you know, I see you're, you're very sad or you seem mad. So they, they can understand what um, what word to use next time to um, explain how they're feeling. That can be very helpful. Or sometimes challenging behavior is the result of just getting so stressed to the point of frustration that you just explode. You can't functionally express yourself anymore. Um, we've all been there. You know, you get stressed to the point where you just kind of snap at someone. Um, and you're you're able to communicate. You have the ability to say like I'm really stressed, but your stress level gets to the point where um, it you just need a release. You can't really um, calmly verbally express yourself anymore. So what is the function of the behavior? Um, that's what we have to find out. What is the child trying to communicate? Um, so that we know how to properly address the behavior. Is it to acquire something? Do they want a toy? Do they want a break? Um, is it to avoid something? They don't want to do something? Or is it to just completely escape from something? So when you see acquisition type behavior, that's usually to uh, gain something. So they're um, maybe trying to get attention from a parent or a teacher, and that could be positive attention or negative attention. And negative attention can actually be a stronger reinforcer um, than positive attention. It's stronger at uh, reinforcing a behavior that you may not want to be reinforcing in the first place. Uh, but if a child is having a hard time, you know, getting their parent to attend to them, acting out will certainly bring them over, give them eye contact, have them interact with them. And even if it's maybe not the kind of contact they want, they're still getting parental contact. Um, or you have the child in school that acts out to be the class clown or does things for shock value. Um, those are all examples of how um, negative attention can re reinforce you know certain unwanted behaviors the child might be trying to acquire a personal item like a toy or a food or you know an ipad something like that or an activity going to the park um you know playing a game with their sister uh they might be trying to acquire something for a personal need they could be hungry tired 
um, not feeling well. Or they could be acquiring some type of sensory stimulation, which we'll get into more in the sensory integration lecture, but that is also trying to acquire something they need for another personal need. So let's look at two examples. Example one shows Riley who wants to have a play date with Olivia. In order to have the play date, Riley must first clean her room. Riley cleans her room by herself in order to have the play date with Olivia. So that's kind of showing a, a positive way that um, behavior is reinforced by uh, acquiring something that the child wants. So the parent wants her to clean her room. And in order to do that, um, she Riley, Riley wants her, what she's acquiring is the wants the play date with Olivia. So in order to do that, she needs to clean her room first. So she's acquiring the play date and the behavior that's being reinforced is her cleaning her room. Now on the other side, uh, Matthew is going for a walk with his mother. As they pass an ice cream shop, he gestures and points, trying to ask his mother to stop for ice cream. Now Matthew's nonverbal, so he's using the this you know uh, body language and gesturing to try to get his mother to understand his wants and needs, but his mother doesn't understand and keeps walking, and this sends Matthew into a full-on tantrum. So the behavior is the tantrum. The cause of it was acquisition, him wanting the ice cream. How do you deal with acquisition behaviors then? So just like in the example with the cleaning the room, using it as your motivator. So the child wanted the play date, using the play date as the motivator for the behavior that you want. Um, if the child really wants the Elmo toy and you want them to go up the stairs, use the Elmo toy as their motivator to make them go up the stairs so they can acquire the toy. Uh, what you don't want to do is, like we said before, reinforce um, negative behaviors, something that's drawing negative attention um, to reinforce a behavior. You need to uh, ignore that, those behaviors to let them like phase out and instead you wait till they're being good. You catch them being good and give them praise for that. Or if there's another child, um, let's say you're working in a therapy gym and there's another child working with another therapist that's showing really good behavior you give praise and good attention to that child <clears throat> so you also need to figure out if it's the behavior is to acquire some sort of sensory stimulation that the child needs and if that behavior is productive or non-productive and that we're going to talk in the next lecture um, or you need to determine if the child has an intrinsic need are they tired do they need a break do they need food? Are they thirsty? With avoidance type behaviors, the child is trying to get out altogether of trying to do something um, that you want them to do. This occurs before the task even starts. So they might be avoiding a specific request you have of them, performing a specific task, they um, might not have the confidence to perform that task, or it just might not be deemed, you know, fun for them. Um, they could be avoiding, you know, a specific activity or a person. So if you have, uh, you know, maybe a very loud, boisterous voice, or you wear a specific perfume that the child has kind of an aversion to, or maybe your temperament just doesn't mesh well with them, they could show behaviors avoiding um, interacting with you right from the get-go um, or a certain environment so if you're trying to bring a child to the PT gym and they find it you know too busy too loud the lights are too bright there's too many kids running around um, they might be avoiding the task just because of that environment or transitions transitions are can be very stressful for a lot of kids um, they might not be sure of what's going to happen, what's going to be requested of them. They might not want to go because the activity that they're performing uh, before the transition may be more desirable than what you, they want, you want them to do after um, 
or it just could be fear of the unknown. They don't know what they're going to encounter on the way. So let's look at some examples. Um, Devin is asked to do her homework. She does not want to do her homework, so she goes to her room and cries and stomps on the floor. Her behavior has successfully led to avoiding doing her homework for 20 minutes until she has finished crying. So she didn't start her homework, get frustrated, and stop. It was the mere asking of her to do her homework that caused that behavior, her to avoid the um, homework. Another example, um, and this is a real-life example of my daughter when she was in preschool. Um, it's cleanup time in Cameron's preschool class, and Cameron does not like to clean up. Every time her teacher announces it's time to clean up, Cameron goes to the bathroom and stays there until the task is finished, successfully avoiding having to clean up. So how do we address avoidance type behaviors? Um, we'll go into more detail later of specific examples of all of these things, but um, right now keeping it kind of brief, you want to use visual support. So you can use it, a picture to show the child what they're going to be doing in what order to help them stay on task. Um, it helps to use a reward or a token system for desired behaviors. So you know, after you do um, walking up the stairs, then you get, you know, two minutes to play with that toy that you wanted, or you get a sticker for your book, some sort of reward that's meaningful for the child. Uh, you want to prompt desired behaviors for each step. So let's say with transitions. Okay, Johnny, you're going to put the iPad down. We're going to stand up, push the chair in. Hold Miss Kelly's hand and we're going to walk down the hallway to the therapy room. You want to use what's called a therapeutic use of self. That's when you kind of look within and try to identify any personal things about you that could be contributing to avoidance behavior. Am I talking too loud? Am I not animated enough with my talking? Um, is this hand lotion I am using too strong of a smell for the child? anything like that. Um, you want to prepare a child in advance for transitions and, and have them um, understand and, and be aware of what they're going to encounter on the way. We're going to be walking in the hallway. The hallway is going to be busy, but I'm going to be right there with you and hold your hand or help you navigate through, yada, yada, yada. Um, and you want to familiarize the child with all aspects of the task that you're asking them to do how you expect them to do it, um, and what it's going to look like. So now let's talk about escape behaviors. And these are different from avoidance in that in avoidance, the child uh, doesn't start the activity. In the escape behaviors, a child will actually start the activity, but then at some point gives up and abandons the activity. So some reasons for this could be um, the task that they started uh, was found to be too challenging and they don't have the ability to say, hey, this is too hard. So they just kind of, you know, walk away from it. The task could, once they get started, seem too boring or not challenging enough. The task may seem to have no end. So, um, for example, if you are, you know, taking an exercise class and the instructor has you doing mountain climbers and, you know, you're sitting there like, oh, my God, we've been doing these mountain climbers forever. And she doesn't tell you how many you're going to be doing or for how long you're going to be doing it. And at some point you're like, All right, I'm just going to stop, take a little break. And then once you get started again, the teacher's like, and we're done. So if she had told you from the beginning that we're going to do these 30 times or for a minute straight, you kind of have an idea of when it's going to end and when you're going to be getting that break. But when it seems to have no end, you decide kind of when you want to take that break. It's the same thing with the child. If it just seems to have no end, they'll just kind of stop. Um, they could be having some sort of sensory processing difficulty and um, they're, you're either moving them in a way that is triggering for them or they're feeling a you know, tactile sensation that they don't like or for whatever reason, which you'll understand more in the next lecture, they could uh, escape from the activity for that reason. Um, or if the task has no meaning to the child. So if you're having them, um, let's say, do some sort of like 
stretch where they're just kind of reaching forward and, and they don't understand that, you know, it's, you're doing it for a stretch. They just see it as reaching forward and there's really no point to them reaching forward. Um, they might just escape the activity for, for that way. But if you put that task into something that has meaning where, you know, they're leaning forward so they can take a, you know, dry erase marker and then stand up and, you know, play tic-tac-toe on a board and repeat it over and over again. That task has meaning to the child, so they'll do that activity over and over again for you. So how do we address escape type behaviors? So this is where you want to do a nice task analysis and figure out at what part of this activity or this task the breakdown is occurring. So is it that one little piece of it is too difficult for the child or they're not understanding what to do or um, they don't have the sensory processing ability to go through with the task, but really trying to identify the specific point um, where this breakdown is happening because the child started the task. So it wasn't like deemed overwhelming, uh, but they get to a certain point that they figure it's either too hard or has no meaning or there's no end. Um, once you can figure that out, if it's something that's too challenging, you can take that part of the task and try to break it down into smaller, easier parts. So the child feels a little bit more um, accomplished. You're giving them a little bit of support to get through that one little piece so they can eventually um, accomplish the entire task. Um, you may want to intersperse easier tasks with more challenging tasks for the same reason. So they're feeling some sense of accomplishment um, in a time where, you know, they're kind of feeling like they're failing. So you kind of are giving them some breaks in that way. Um, or you might need to offer a break from the entire activity. So sometimes um, you need to actually help a child, give them a cue how to ask for a break and whether that be like a gesture or a, a keyword that they can say that you know will give you an idea of this is this is a lot and you know I need a couple minutes um, and, and that can be very helpful uh, and just make sure that the task has a purpose you know think play these these kids are children and their number one role as children their job is to play that's how they learn um, so if you make sure that the task has a purpose and it's meaningful and you're putting it in the context of um, play that's age appropriate, um, that should help um, address those escape behaviors. So another question you'll have to ask yourself is what you're seeing from the child. Is it sensory related? Are they trying to fill an intrinsic need? Or is it really behavior that's trying to communicate something to you? That's why we really have to go back to the why. Um, is the child needing some sort of movement or uh, sensory stimulation to keep their body alert and engaged? Um, or is, um, and is what they're doing productive or non-productive? Is it helping them stay alert and engaged or is it actually causing them to be more disorganized and disruptive? Um, is the behavior or, you know, if, if it is sensory related, um, is it safe or potentially harmful? Is it, you know, interfering with the other children in the room? Um, these are addressed much, much differently. We're going to go into that much more in the next lecture. Uh, but as an example, um, Gus, who has a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, um, in the middle of his math lesson, gets out of his chair and, you know, runs and jumps across the room to turn the lights on and off. <clears throat> so you need to figure out, is Gus escaping from math? Was it too hard and too difficult and he just needs to get away from it? Or is he getting out of his chair and running and jumping to get some vestibular input and proprioceptive input to keep his body alert and awake and, you know, turning the lights on and off to get some visual stimulation? 
Um, so this is something that um, needs to be addressed quite differently. So that's why it's really important to kind of tease that out. Is it a sensory need or is it really a behavior that they're trying to, you know, avoid, acquire, or escape from something? So then the million dollar question is, if we know it's sensory related, how do we address those behaviors? Well, stay tuned for that because there's going to be a whole lot of that in the next lecture. We also need to consider somatic factors. So what are the intrinsic um, needs of the body that could be causing us to behave in a not so desirable way? Um, so fatigue, for one thing, um, being sick, being in pain, being hungry. Um, as an example, and this again happened real life example, um, Devin comes home from school and her sister bumps into her accidentally. And normally this wouldn't bother Devin, but she hasn't had her after school snack yet. So she's really hungry and she's probably tired from school. Um, and she reacts to the bump as if she was sucker punched to the gut, like literally drops to the floor, screaming, crying, yelling at her sister, um, you know, waving her arms around to try to get a, you know, get a hit in on her sister. Um, her behavior is way out of proportion to the event, but because of, you know, the stress going on in her body from being hungry and being tired, she wasn't able to use her, her normal coping mechanisms to, you know, deal with something that should have been a, a non-event. Um, this happens to, to all of us, but as adults, we have the ability most of the time to control it, to identify what it is, and to take the necessary action to correct it. And kids don't always have the ability to, one, identify where the uncomfortable feeling is coming from and have the words to express what they need or what they're feeling or know how to address it. Finding the why, uh, it's, it's not always easy um, because the, the same behavior can be used by a child for, for different whys. So, um, for example, at recess, Brian might bite his thumb because he's so excited to be outside. Um, but in art, he might bite his thumb because he wants to be taken out of the room and he knows that behavior, if he doesn't stop it, they might remove him from the room. Um, for whatever reason, maybe he doesn't like the um, smell of the paint in art room. But in the classroom, he might bite his thumb to avoid doing his work. So um, it, it's really important to, to identify um, not just what type of behavior it is, but what's the cause of that behavior um, so that you can address it in the right way. Uh, but, you know, luckily, you're not alone in this. There's there's a team, especially if you're working in a school setting. You have psychologists and social workers and teachers and um, behavior interventionists. The child might have a, um, a behavior plan and, and you're kind of just following along. Um, but you also could be seeing a child in a clinic or in their home and there might not be this team readily available around you. Um, so it could be up to you to really figure out, you know, how best to um, to intervene. You may also come across some people who are uh, quote unquote behavior experts. Uh, like we talked about, the school psychologist or the social worker is a good go-to person if you're having difficulty with a child's uh, challenging behavior. Um, but if you work in a school setting or an institutional setting where um, there's a large population of children with challenging behaviors. They might have what's called a BCBA, it's a board certified behavior analyst. And this person um, has a lot of training and experience in applied behavioral analysis and, um, you know, analyzing behaviors. And their job is to um, conduct what's called a, a functional behavior assessment. And they observe children to find um, the behaviors that are, um, that the, you know, the teacher is noticing or the therapist is noticing that is causing an issue and then trying to figure out, um, what the antecedent is 
So, you know, what's causing this child to um, have show these behaviors? And then they come up with an intervention plan that they, um, you know, present to the entire team. So everybody is consistent in ways that they're going to address the behaviors and whether it's avoiding certain situations um, or um, coming up with a token system for rewarding good behavior. There's there's lots of um, you know different options, but they're the ones that really are the experts in analyzing behavior and designing the intervention plan. Uh, you may also come across what's called an RBT, it's a registered behavioral therapist. Um, these therapists work under the direction of a BCBA, so where the BCBA analyzes the behavior and creates the intervention plan, the RBT implements the plan. So they might be working one-on-one -on -one with the student, they might be um, just in a uh, one classroom helping out the staff, um, but they're kind of um, putting forth these behavior strategies. So to help us find the why, we're going to look at the ABCs of behavior. So this stands for uh, A is antecedent, uh, what happened just prior to the behavior. Um, was there something in the environment? Was a demand placed on the child? Was something taken away from the child? Um, and were there any warning signs that the child gave? Um, sometimes before kids have a big outburst, you might notice their face might become flushed or you might clench their fists really tight or clench their jaw really tight. Um, there might be something that the child does, you know, routinely that shows that they're about to lose it. Um, and then B for behavior, you need to really kind of define what the behavior is that you're seeing. What does it look like? What is the child doing? How frequently are they doing it? How long does it last, the rate of the behavior? How long till, you know, the child's calm? Um, that identifying the behavior helps you put a plan in place to um, figure out what the proper behavior is that you're trying to instill. Um, and C is the consequence. So what was the result of the behavior? Uh, were there reinforcers that helped strengthen the behavior? Um, was it successful, the behavior? Did it get them what they wanted? Uh, was what they were doing dangerous to themselves or dangerous to others around them? Uh, was it distracting to themselves or distracting to you know, classmates? So identifying each of these helps you start to figure out the function of the behavior, um, the cause of the behavior, and what reinforcers are being used. So we've mentioned, or uh, I've mentioned reinforcers a few times. So what are these reinforcers? Well, a reinforcer is a consequence um, of the behavior that causes the behavior to be repeated over and over again. And it can be positive or it can be negative. So we can break those up into primary reinforcers and secondary reinforcers. Your primary reinforcers are ones that are biologically inherent. It's not a uh, taught response or a learned response. Um, it's something that naturally is a benefit to the child. So whether that's a sensory need, um, you know, something like a vestibular input, something that's calming to the body or kind of wakes the body up, that's a primary reinforcer. Um, or also um, edibles, so whether it's food or um, a drink, something that the child can eat um, that naturally um, has a benefit to the child. It's not something that, that they learn, oh, if I get a snack, that's a good thing. Like the, it's just naturally, um, naturally known. So, uh, you know, in PT, we really try to avoid using edibles as reinforcers. Um, primarily what we're working on is movement and we don't want the child having food in their mouth and putting them at risk for choking. However, 
uh, it's very common in ABA, which you'll learn uh, when we talk about autism spectrum disorder, that um, edibles are pretty commonly used as reinforcers. Um, so if that's part of the child's behavior plan, you may be following through with, with that plan. Uh, we also have secondary reinforcers, which are different than the primary because it is something that is conditioned or learned and has some sort of value that's uh, different for everybody. So whether that's praise, giving a high five, um, notoriety, a hug, um, so that child's learned that that is, you know, um, a reward in some way, but it may have different meaning or different value to different children. Um, earning a privilege. So let's say, you know, you finish your homework before four o'clock, you get to go out on the trampoline. That's, that's earning a privilege. Um, stickers or a reward chart. Um, that's a reinforcer that, you know, you have to do a certain amount of work to earn a sticker for the chart. Um, the sticker itself might be a reinforcer or it could be a um, chart to earning some other type of reward. Um, like I said before, attention can be positive or negative and negative can be a very strong reinforcer and um, also punishment. But the thing to know about secondary reinforcers are that it's not, um, the, doesn't have the same value for, for each child, whereas one child may really respond well to praise, um, another child may respond really well to attention. So it's, it's different, it's not inherent. So what do we use? Primary reinforcers or secondary reinforcers? So you're going to start with primary reinforcers for those kids who the secondary reinforcers have no meaning or no value. Um, you know, for some kids, the stickers are, you know, meaningless. The praise doesn't really, you know, do it for them. Um, that's when you have to start with, you know, either the movement or um, edibles or something, you know, intrinsic that, you know, it, it is naturally meaningful for them. But when you do start with that, you eventually want to space them further and further out. So you're teaching them delayed gratification. So they need to do a little bit more work before they obtain a reinforcer. Um, and then you're going to gradually transition to secondary reinforcers. You know, sometimes that takes time to find something that is meaningful and valuable for the child. Um, and make sure that the quality of the reinforcer should match the degree of the demand placed on the child. So you're not going to, you know, ask them to do an hour's worth of work for, you know, a little sticker or the same degree. You're not going to ask them to, you know, jump two times and they get their iPad for an hour. Um, so it really has to be a good match. There's a lot of support in the research for using differential reinforcers. So for the same child, um, you might be reinforcing the same behavior or different behaviors, but you could be giving small reinforcers for um, short or small amount of time, you know, showing the appropriate behavior. Intermediate rewards for um, lasting a little bit longer, whether it be a day or a week. Um, and then big reinforcers, so if you could last a whole month doing, you know, behaving the right way, you might earn, you know, a movie with a family or, you know, a night out to dinner or, you know, something a little bit bigger than maybe a toy, which was that intermediate reinforcer. Um, and then you could have a huge reinforcer, so if you could last, you know, a whole year, maybe we'll take that trip to go, you know, visit grandma over the summer, something like that. Um, but whatever you find that works for the child, whatever reinforcer is um, having a benefit, make sure you don't ruin it. And the number one cause of a reinforcer losing its effectiveness 
is when you give the reinforcer out regardless of the performance. Um, and this happens so easily and so often where, you know, you might say, um, you know, if you do X, Y, and Z, then um, I'll give you this donut, let's say. Um, and the child does X, Y, but Z gets pretty hard and they just, you know, they kind of can't do it and they um, just give up. And then, you know, the parent or the, the therapist or whatever will say, you know what, you, you tried really hard. We'll give you the donut anyway. Well, then they're going to learn that they don't necessarily need to accomplish everything that they're being asked and they'll still get the reward. So then the reinforcer becomes um, ineffective. So now what do we do? So we looked at the function of the behavior and the outcome of the behavior, um, but now we need to try to change that behavior. So um, in order to change the behavior from something that you know you don't want them to be doing, um, you have to make the outcome or what you want them to do more desirable than what they originally wanted to do or wanted to get out of. Um, you need to know what makes the child tick. So you have your teachers, parents, um, they know the child very well and ask them, you know, what does the child enjoy at home? What games, what shows, characters, sports, hobbies, songs, anything that can be used as a, as a motivator um, to help this child participate. So as you know, all aspects of life, proper planning does prevent poor performance. So it really does help to plan in advance. And do you have to do this for every child that you work with? No, it's, it's really for those whose, you know, behavior is interfering with your ability to um, have a productive session. So for these kids, you're going to review and lay out the session plan at the beginning. Let them know, first we're going to do this, then we're going to do this. Um, it kind of gives them an idea of what they're in for, can uh, relieve any you know anxiety or fear of the unknown. Um, and, and this is not pediatric specific. Um, I used to do this when I worked in the you know adult orthopedic world, where I would tell you know my patients first you know we're going to do this and then we're going to work on that. It just gives them an idea of what they're going to be doing and when we're going to be done. And um, it's just nice to know and not be guessing. Uh, but you really need to cater your instructions to your audience. So um, for some kids, they might not be able to handle a lot of verbal instruction. You might need to give very short one to two word instructions. Um, if, you know, cognitively they can't understand all the words that you're saying or um, maybe their attention span is limited and, you know, you're losing them after the first couple words and they're they're not taking in all of your verbal instructions. Um, you can use things like a checklist or a visual schedule. We're gonna, I'm going to show you examples of those in a second, but it's just giving a clear idea to the child of um, what we're going to do and in what order. So this is an example of, you know, a very simple checklist that you could use with uh, maybe an older child, actually someone that can read, so they're, um, you know, so they're reading the the activity that they're doing, so they know, you know, first they're doing trampoline, and when they're done with trampoline, they can put a check mark on it or cross it out, so they're um, feeling some sense of accomplishment, like they're getting somewhere as they check things off of the list, um, and then they know, you know, the more things that get checked off or crossed off, the closer they are to being done. These are two examples of how you can use uh, visual schedules. So there's lots of programs you can use for these, uh, you know, picture cards, but you can just find pictures on the internet, laminate them, stick some Velcro, and you can have one line for what we're going to be doing in this session, and then the other line is for when it's completed. So they can, you know, tear the picture off of the Velcro which is going to give them some you know, sensory input and, um, you know, everybody loves Velcro. And then they stick it to the completed side so that way um, they're 
seeing how much they've accomplished and what's left for them to do. Um, on the right, it's just another type of example. This has, you know, the outline for the whole day, but you could have your, you know, your activities for your session. And every time you finish one, you just take it off and, and dump it in like the little catch-all on the bottom. And then when there's nothing left, we're all done. So when you're using a written or visual schedule and you're giving them the lineup, they're showing them what activities they're going to be doing and in what order. Um, if that still isn't keeping them on task, you might need to start adding in some uh, rewards in there, either choice time of an activity or a specific toy um, or something that's, you know, just rewarding for them. And the amount of work that you're asking them to do before um, obtaining a reward is going to be child dependent. So um, younger children, children with intellectual disability, autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, um, or just children with low motivation, you're going to need shorter intervals. So shorter amount of work before they get a reward. Um, and that could be as simple as, you know, um, why lift your foot, touch the cone. And as, as soon as they do that, they follow one command, then you give them the car that they want. And, you know, they might only be able to play with it for a short amount of time before they have to, you know, give it back and do more work. Um, but the hope is that they see, they get the sense of, um, if I do this, then I get that. And then you can start stretching that out to longer and longer intervals as they're, you know, getting the hang of it. Delayed gratification is a, it's a learned skill. Um, and for some kids, it takes a longer time to learn it. And in this day and age with um, our culture of instant gratification, it's, it's even takes even longer to learn. Um, so, for example, um, Abigail, when you move all the squares to the done side, you can have three minutes of choice time with any of my toys. So, uh, whereas Wyatt only had to lift his foot and touch the cone once and he got his reward, Abigail has to do maybe three or four activities before she can get her reward time. So we're really working on that delayed gratification and, and um, asking her to do more and more work before earning that reward. So when in doubt, you can rely on the good old if then. Um, and that's, that's really used when things need to be simplified even more. Um, but now we use the terminology first then, uh, since you know, if you're saying, if you do this, then you get that, that's implying that you're giving them a choice and they can always say no to that choice. So if you say first, we do this, then you get that, um, you're not really giving them um, an opt out, but you need to know what motivates them for the then part. What tangible do they want to work for? What activity? Is it just a break? Um, we're going to always try to avoid food, especially candy, um, unless, you know, it's part of their behavior intervention plan and you need to be following that. But um, not only that, because of, you know, choking and, and that sort of thing, but we also want to avoid those primary reinforcers when possible, especially if secondary reinforcers are meaningful and valuable to them. We really want to stick with those. Um, and then we want to try to use what they like and turn it into another PT activity whenever possible. So if Johnny, all he wants to do is play with his Paw Patrol doll, um, you might say like, first, we're gonna jump to all the circles, then we can play with your Paw Patrol doll, but we're not just gonna sit and play with your Paw Patrol doll, we're gonna play catch with your Paw Patrol doll. So now we're turning that into an eye-hand coordination activity, but you just think you're getting the reward of playing with your Paw Patrol doll. Um, or another example for, you know, the little social butterfly that wants to stick her head into every classroom and we want to get her to climb up the stairs, we might say, okay, first we're going to climb the stairs, then you get to say hi to the art teacher. Okay, first we go down the stairs, then you get to say hi to the gym teacher. So it's just a, a very simple, first you do this, then you get that. To get 
better participation, you can offer choices. A child feels more in control when um, he or she feels that they've made the choice. But you can be sneaky and gear it towards your goals. So um, you can either offer them two activities that you want them to do, or um, you might want to offer a less desirable activity along with the activity that you really want the child to do. So you're kind of steering them in the direction that you want to go, but they still feel like they were able to make the choice of what they wanted to do. Um, or you can figure out your the activities that you want to work on in that session and maybe let the child choose the order in which they perform them. So a couple examples. Um, if your goal is to have Zachary climb up the steps to get a car, um, you might say, Zachary, would you like to frog jump to knock over the cones? Or would you like to climb up the stairs and get the race car to bring to the track? So you might already know that Zachary doesn't like to frog jump because it's, you know, too much work for him. It's too exhausting. So you know that he's going to pick the other one because um, it's, you know, easier in his mind, and that's really what you wanted to work on anyway. But you're giving him the choice and kind of steering it towards what you want to get done. Um, or you could just be offering choice for, um, you know, the the toy that you work on work with to do the activity. So if you are working on um, sit to stand and you want to use either like a puzzle or some type of game to get them to do it. You might say, okay, we're going to do this activity. Did you want to use the Dora the Explorer puzzle or the Minnie Mouse uh, dress up game to do? So they're, they're having the choice as to um, what kind of motivator, what game they're using to perform the activity that you want them to do. So the child that you're working with may already have a behavior intervention plan put in place. Um, this is usually created by the team, either a behavior interventionist or the psychologist or sometimes just the classroom teacher. And um, they have set up some type of um, reward system where they, um, you know, have to, you know, identify a behavior that they're, you know, trying to get the child to do. and Either, you know, every half hour that they're exhibiting that behavior, they get to, in this example, move the car in other space. And when they get to the star, the end, they earn their reward. And you can see the box up top, it says what I'm working for. Um, and that might be a picture or a word, either, you know, iPad time or whatever. Um, it could be, you know, whatever is valuable to the child, um, but they know that you know, as soon as they get the car all the way to the start, they're going to earn that reward. Um, and th these behavior intervention plans and these reward, reward charts can, can look different, but it's kind of the same concept. Um, so the, um, the thing is you might have to <clears throat> give a child frequent reminders as to what they're working for. So they know about their behavior intervention plan, but um, sometimes it's hard to <laughs> be showing the behavior that the teachers want, and especially when you're getting frustrated or bored or whatnot, um, and just naturally the undesirable behavior start to surface, then that's your job to say, remember what we're working for? And that reminder usually is enough to kick in like, oh yeah, I got to keep it together because if I don't, I won't get my car to the star and I won't get that reward. So we talked about transitions uh, before and how stressful they can be for some kids. Um, and that could be the transition of leaving the classroom and going to PT or stopping one activity in PT to start another one. Um, or when, you know, PT ends and it's time to go back to the classroom. So giving a, a verbal warning ahead of time um, helps kids, you know, realize that uh, something is about to change. So, you know, saying like, Bobby, we have five minutes left of PT and then it's time to go back to class. 
And now there's three minutes left, and now one minute left. It's time to go back to class. Um, well, that's all good, but for a lot of kids, they don't really have a concept of how long one minute or three minutes or five minutes really is. So it still can be jarring um, at the end when, you know, you're suddenly saying, all right, time to go back to class because maybe they expected that one minute to, to last a lot longer than it did. Um, so that's when you can introduce some visual timers to help them um, see how much time is left and whether that's like a, a digital stopwatch or a bubble timer. Um, and we'll show some pictures will come up of that um, where, you know, the the bubble timer is nice because they can see, you know, when the bubbles run out, that's when we're done. And, and there's lots of, you know, um, of those like the colored like bubbles kind of at the top. And as they come down, you see there's less and less and less at the top. And then once they're all sitting at the bottom, that and the, the timer is basically clear. There's no bubbles moving. That's how you know the time is done. Um, or the visual timers are nice because um, it shows you like however many minutes you want to set it for um, and as the time ticks down the amount of red gets smaller and smaller so <clears throat> they kind of have an idea of how much time is really left um, and you know remember the transitions that you know we need to um, let these kids know what to expect for every step of the way giving them prompts, laying everything out, um, but also um, giving them an idea of how you expect them to behave. So maybe in the transition, um, the child's running down the hallway. You don't say, you know, don't run, because sometimes they only hear the last thing you said, and they hear run. So instead, you give them um, the clue of how you want them to perform the task. So we're going to walk back to class, or Bobby, walk. Um, so that can be a little more um, <clears throat> understood and you know always giving them a reminder of what they're working for what reward activity they might um, be earning once they you know do come to PT or do go go back to the classroom something else that helps the young ones in transitions is making the transition into a game. So we could play um, I spy on the way down the hallway to the class. If they're having trouble leaving the room, kind of distract them and make it into a game. Let's see, I'm going to choose something first, and then you get to choose something. So we're in the hallway, you know, I spy something blue, and then the child's looking around trying to find something, and then, and then they get a turn at it. So sometimes that's enough to help. Um, with the transition. Just some other things to consider. Some of these we've kind of talked about already, but um, knowing your child and what kind of directions or verbal instructions you can give them. So um, some kids, you know, really need just simple one word commands. Um, whereas other kids, you can give them more detail of exactly what you want them to do and how you want them to do it. Um, but that might be lost on some other kids. So you really have to um, cater it towards the, you know, the child you're working with. Um, now, if, if prompting is needed, you want to start with less. And then if that doesn't work, you can add on, um, you know, pair verbal with manual prompts. Um, Prompting is different than facilitation. I'm not um, addressing alignment or doing like that. It's just kind of giving them a cue of how I want them to move if the verbal isn't enough. Um, but we want to decrease those prompts as, as quickly as possible. So, for example, um, when I work with children with autism spectrum disorder, um, if they're, they have a hard time um, with their motor learning, motor planning, and imitating. So if, let's say we're working on jumping, and they might not naturally, you know, bend their knees and then propel up off of the floor. So I might start with giving them a cue, you know, to bend up, bend up. Then if that doesn't work, I might, you know, tap at their knee when I say bend, so they know what I'm talking about, bend where, bend the knees. 
if that doesn't work, I might, you know, give them some um, cue at their pelvis and, and, and push down. So I'm teaching, I'm showing them exactly what I want them to do. Um, but as soon as they start to get it, I have to start pulling back on those prompts so they don't become prompt dependent, um, <clears throat> which can especially occur with, with manual prompts. Um, but the idea is that when you're uh, pairing the prompts with a verbal cue and they get that idea, eventually you you can pull that manual prompt away and you'll, they'll only need the verbal cue for a while until they really get that motor plan down and then you can pull even back on the verbal cue. Uh, but you also want to consider your own energy level, your intonation, how you present. Um, for, you know, for different kids. So if you have a, a child with really high energy level and, you know, a little maybe impulsive and, and um, have difficulty with attention, I might want to talk at, you know, a lower, slower pace, a little calmer, less body movements um, to try to calm them down a little bit as opposed to a child who's kind of really like a low energy level kid. I might want to talk a lot louder and quicker and use big animated body movements to try to pep them up a little bit. Um, <clears throat> you always want to try to use their own likes as, as, you know, as much as possible to um, motivate them. Um, if, you know, if you know what their likes are and you can figure that out. But just remember that fun is the biggest motivator, regardless of what their own likes and interests are. As long as you're making the activity fun, the child's going to be engaged. They're going to be, you know, a willing participant and you'll have a productive session and get what you need to get out of that session. So what does the research say? Um, there's a good deal of evidence that supports the use of differential reinforcement for um, promoting good behavior. So that was the idea of, you know, not just using stickers for short term good behavior and not just using a huge reward for being able to, you know, show good behavior for a really, really, really long amount of time, but offering all of those and in between. So um, the stickers for little things, you know, moderate, intermediate rewards for a little bit more time, um, and then those really, really big, big rewards for, you know, holding it together for a really, really long amount of time. Uh, the, the evidence also supports giving children self-management procedures. So <laughs> it's giving children the ability to um, showing them ways to recognize their own needs, to help give them words that help them identify what they're feeling, um, strategies to help them recognize what they need and communicate that need to others. Um, that's been shown to really have a, a positive impact on behavior and managing, you know, challenging behaviors. Um, giving children choice, that's, um, you know, very strong in the research as well, and as well as the use of the activity schedules that we talked about, um, and also using positive rewards to change behavior faster than um, consequences, um, and remembering that. Um, we don't want to give negative attention. We want to kind of um, reward the positive and, you know, ignore the behavior that we don't want them to be um, showing. 